Uh, my, my suggestion is that uh, my suggestion is that you write out for yourself uh, a one pager of what you learned here. Some of the things I'm going to tell you, you will know already. You should know already. Quite a lot of what I'm going to tell you. Now the reminders may be helpful, but I suggest you do a one pager. That's what I used to do. Like, and I still add to add and make yellow stickies to things that I learn from other people because I don't have all the answers. I'm still learning. I come up with some good ideas, but some of the really good ideas come from somebody else that I take as is or or amend to what I'm doing. So I suggest you do a one pager so is that the next time you're doing a writing job, it's a, a, a leave, uh, an arbitration, a, a long letter, an opinion, uh, and peel materials, an arbitration, whatever, motion record, look at, look at your one pager and it will tell you what you need to focus on. So the one pager can be extremely, extremely helpful. Let's just jump right into this by saying this. Have you ever, um put your hand up if you're on the screen or 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 if you want and ask let me ask you this have you ever written something that makes you feel really smart that is really smart like I i'm muted i'm back off mute um the if you have done that as i have done that that's actually bad writing that's not smart writing. If you write something that makes you feel smart, that's not smart writing. Smart writing is where you write something for the other person. And it's a, and it's a common mistake that so many lawyers do is they write for themselves because they ultimately they want to make themselves feel smart on top of it, knowledgeable, know the case well. And that's not, that's not the job. That's to make yourself feel smart. I'm going to go through the, the paper. I'm going to take my uh watch off and glenn is going to give me a 10 minute and a five minute warning um i want to uh fairly quickly go through some of the highlights in this paper uh let me just keep an eye on the watch here um but i want to also have some time to 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 look at some of the practical examples <clears throat> precedents if you want at the end to show you that to speak plainly this is not just artsy fartsy stuff you will win an awful lot more cases uh, if you follow what is what is done, what is here, if you write strategically, write persuasively, like if you watch TV or too much TV, you think that it's it's and even socially lawyers are thought to be really smart if they're fast, fast on their feet. Uh, I, I've come up with some really smart things to say in response, but I'm always eight hours too late. Like I think of something really smart at three o'clock in the morning, something that happened in court. It's, it's, I'm always way too late. So you can, you can be a successful lawyer and be as dumb as I am in terms of, in terms of not coming by, with a quick repartee. And that's done by writing. And it's uh, an undervalued skill, depending on the area of law you're working in. And it's, a, and it's something that lawyers are not very good at um, in terms of writing effectively. Um, I'm going to go through the paper here and um and just do it paragraph by paragraph number but i'm going to be skipping an awful lot so my suggestion is that uh i don't know if glenn has sent you out the paper already and glenn if you have it if you if you have the paper you're welcome to send the paper out as soon as you want to you're welcome to send to everybody the powerpoint slides and they definitely will need the tabs that we're going to be looking at in the in this in the second 20 in the last 20 minutes of the paper so i'll leave that up to glenn so um let me ask glenn if you can take your mute off does everybody have the paper would that be would that be possible before we proceed uh it's going to be a little bit difficult to get that done now eugene uh what i was okay. going to do was send it out right after the session was over uh okay. along with the tabs and and everything else and as well put it up on the uh on the channel when we post the recording Okay, the, the tabs the tabs are important so is that so is that people can see what I'm actually if what, what I'm actually going to be referring to. So if there's some convenient way, Glenn, to get the paper out to the registrants and also that the tabs that would that would be helpful. All right, we'll get on that. Okay, thank you. So uh, once you get the paper and maybe if you can make some notes, uh, those here uh, of I'm just going to do it paragraph we'll give you the paragraph number. So is that uh, so is you can refer to it. So paragraph number one talks about lawyers think they fulfill the role by delivering information. Yeah, that's true. But 
It's a lot more than that. How you deliver that information is what is important. The sequencing of it is very important. Whether you start at the beginning, whether you tell your story from the motor vehicle accident, whether you start it uh, like later, the timing in the sequences is important. Um, paragraph four in the paper is being simple without being simplistic to find that balance. And sometimes that balance is difficult and sometimes you will feel simplistic. But remember when you're arguing to an arbitrator, unless it's a specialized arbitrator, if you're arguing to a, a trial judge or the court of appeal, they're generalists. Uh, they really are generalists. Now, some of them have more experience in certain areas, but you have to find the balance. There's a lawyer that I know in Winnipeg, a firm called Myers, that says, don't write like a lawyer, write like a person. And uh, another thing he said is your argument has to be understood before it can be accepted. It has to be understood before it can be accepted. So it's your job to break it down. It's your job to make it understandable to the person that's reading it or going to listen to it. Um, I mean, I've done some intellectual property cases and, uh, and what I've tried to do with the assistance of professionals is figure out what the chemistry is or the physics. In one particular case, it was an extremely large printing machine. And then once I'd figured out through explanation and with help to tell some that somebody else, I'd break it down into steps. And I came up with a, a, like a, a, a written way to do it and, and a schematic to do it to show how this printing uh, system worked and how a particular part of that printing was key and how that was a breach of a patent. Um, so um, find that balance. Oral argument, written argument, it's a misnomer. Uh, do not argue. Um, because it's called written argument, oral argument, don't. Paragraph five is uh, the best argument at that is that which seems an explanation. So is that if the listener, the reader to what you're saying, to what you're saying or reading says, says, that makes sense. I understand where this is going. Paragraph 10, um, uh, and we're going to the next, uh, the, the, the next one here, number four, thank you. Look at how the things look. So how the, the material is presented on the paper is extremely important. A lot of lawyers and writers spend little time figuring out how to best organize the material on the page so it's block paragraph after block paragraph after block and it just becomes boring and the reader speeds up so there's various things in the next paragraph paragraph 11 render leader sorry reader friendly writing is important and there's various rules of Eugene, I think you're muted again. I don't know why that keeps happening. Um, let me know when that when that happens again. I am not touching the screen apart from unmuting myself. Um, uh, paragraph 19 uh, is headed, avoid the usual crap uh, formulaic qualifiers and phrases. So yeah, the usual crap avoid. So, you know, like we would submit. No, don't, you're not submitting to anything. Like you're not submissive. You're not in some sort of stupid medieval game. Uh, you're not playing chess. Um, so the appellant respectfully submits. No, like don't say that stuff. Like there's only so much respect even judges uh, of, any, of any type can absorb. So it's, so don't go there. So other ones like, you know, like essentially for all the foregoing reasons, it's all language that makes you feel smart. Drop that stuff, just say it. Drop the armor and say it. Um, drop the smart, paragraph 20, the smart sounding lingo too. There's a bunch of um, on the page here, like short words and long words. So avoid the smart stuff. Like he was aware of the fact that no, nobody speaks like that. Like he knew that, he knew, you know, it's, and yeah, you can follow the rules of grammar, but you don't need to follow all of them. Like, not all sentences have to have a verb. You can start a sentence with get. You can start a sentence with and or but. Um, your your English high school teacher isn't here. Well, maybe here, but they're not going to. They may not be reading what you're going to write. So drop that. Uh, and nothing is absolute. The next slide. Um, uh, lawyers like absolutes, and it's it's not helpful. Absolutes trigger what I what I call the readers or the listeners perversity. 
So if you say to the court, for example, um, uh, and this is in paragraph 21 and 22 of the material, um, if you say, um, let's say you're, you're trying to pitch, the campaign was a total failure from beginning to end. The, reader, the reader is going to think, the, the campaign, was it really a campaign? Was a total failure? Was it a total failure uh, from beginning to the end? And they're going to ask, but when was the beginning? When was the end? Like, is all of that true? So absolutes trigger perversity. It triggers questions. So uh, it, if you say something has to be that is absolutely true, it's got to be absolutely true. Like, if you say that it never rained a single day in April or never snowed a single day in July and pick where you want, you've got to prove that. You need the, the reports, the weather reports for every single day. You almost need the video for almost every single day. Paragraph 25, if your mother, uh, next slide number seven, if it doesn't help, don't say it. Like, so don't, uh, don't quote your opponent's argument. Uh, don't do that. Like familiarity, you may think, breeds contempt. It doesn't, it breeds acceptance. So don't quote the other side and then try to knock it down. I used to do that when I was younger and more stupid. Uh, that doesn't work. Just get, you can figure out your strengths. Figure out your vulnerabilities on the other side. The closest you can do, and I've, this is in here somewhere, is to say that I have three challenges. And those three challenges may be the strongest argument on the other side. So if you're up first, it's something that I sometimes do. I've got three, are, three challenges here, and here's how I'm going to deal with that. That's the closest you can go. Uh, uh, paragraph 27, write visually. Um, if, if, if you have time, Pictures, charts, diagrams, and there's a, an example of that, uh, can be very helpful. So if there's some way that you can get out of block boring paragraphs. You muted it again, Eugene. Thank you. And I, the computer unmuted me by mistake. Am I back on? Uh, Glenn, can you hear me all right? Uh, I will assume that I am on. No, you muted yourself. You just went muted again, Eugene. Now you're back. Okay. Uh, I'm not touching it, but let me know as soon as this, uh, as soon as it mutes myself. Uh, paragraph uh, 28, making your legal story work. Um, and that's the next slide. Almost every file, I'm not saying almost every file, but just about every file has a story. Like when Glenn and I were articling together in Edmonton, um 40 years ago roughly um i did a lot of work in the you got muted again eugene i don't know why that's happening um glenn are you able to monitor that and stop me being muted uh in some way are you or does that have to be me i think it has to be you i'm not touching the screen here so let me know every time it, uh, it mutes me and i'll i'll unmute myself um, and uh, forget what my last point was in the muted, making your legal story work. Yeah, every file has a story and it's up to you to sort of, in, a, in an appropriate way, you know, you don't have to sit down and say, you know, in the beginning, uh, yada, yada, but tell a story, make a sequence. And there's an idea that I have in the, in the examples that, that tells that in a chronological way that you can use. My paragraph uh, 30, and the next slide is point first writing. Point first writing is basically, uh, you give the conclusion first and then you support it. And I'll give you some examples of that. So a lot, what a lot of lawyers do is use logic, like A, B, C, therefore D. It is more effective, it's cleaner, it's more professional, more persuasive. If you give the conclusion, support the conclusion. Next point, conclusion, support. You're muted, you're I, now you're back. I took it off again. Uh, I suggest to you that every file that you're working on has a legal theme and it's up to you to figure out what that theme, what that theme is. Um, it's important to stay on theme as well. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I do uh, to figure out what the theme is, and as it said here, I go to Tim Hortons. So I pretend to myself um, that I'm at Tim Hortons and I have a blank piece of paper and no matter what the file is, and you'll see it in some of the examples, almost no matter what the file is, I start it in the same way. Like almost every factum that I write, this case is about, or this test case is about. 
That's what I start. I pretend I'm at Tim Hortons. I'm getting a medium double-double. I get the little triangular scone, the raisin biscuit with an extra butter. I probably shouldn't, but I do. And I'm in the lineup, and there's a young lady there called Fatima, who is from a, uh, not Scotland, not Canada, and is an immigrant like I am. And she says to me, Eugene, you dress like a lawyer, you're going to court, what's your case about? And I have to tell her, in the amount of time that takes her to take out a raisin biscuit, pour the medium double-double, I have to explain to her, not my gender, not my culture, um, not my background, uh, what this case is about. And, 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 when, and it helps you in a way take your legal, legal robes off. And if, if nothing comes to me sitting at the office, I, act, I go to Tim Hortons, like I physically go with a blank piece of paper and I get the, and I make the order and over the coffee, I sit down and I figure it out and it comes to me. Like I sit in Tim Hortons and I look around the room and I think, okay, um, a couple of people here who, how, could, how do I explain it to them? And, and it works. So Tim Hortons will give you the answer. Like I've, I argued some years ago now, I was in federal court for 78 days and I could summarize the whole case in a single sentence, starting with what this case is about. You can encapsulate the whole thing just by doing it that way. Uh, paragraph, uh, paragraph 34, how to stay on, on theme, and that's the next slide. Um, uh, one of the things that I do is I use a thesaurus. They have them in the internet now, of course, but I've still got a Roger's thesaurus that keeps you on, on theme. Some time ago, I had a contract case, and I, and I had a whole list of the, uh, like, um, like uh, the handshake, um, I can't remember them all now, but I had a lot of synonyms for contractual and efficacy and a deal's a deal and all kinds of phrases like that that I, that I worked into the factum. Uh, the next slide, cliche. And this is in paragraph. If this is in, um, uh, and this is in paragraph 30, it, it, it comes across as not that credible. So all the usual, like, like to, to don't write in a fact on things like the bitter end or turn for the, the patient took a turn for the worst or to add insult to injury. None of that stuff. Like, don't go there. Like, be yourself. Like, as Oscar Wilde has taken. You're muted again, Eugene. Okay. Skipping ahead to slide number 15, realistic, there's another, there may be another slide, uh, another slide, another slide uh, to this. And that is every case, it's not just your side, so think about the other side. Think about what they have. As I said earlier, think about their strengths. Their Muted again. Uh, that's off. Uh, the next slide, 16, this is paragraph 46. Let go of the little stuff. Just let little stuff go. So minor misstatements of the law by the other side or the judge, let that go. Don't whack the other side either. Like that's um, um, use courtesy. Like uh, I argued in the Supreme Court of Canada a case a while ago, a case called Ledcor, and the Court of Appeal in Alberta was the Court of Appeal where we're trying to overturn. And we did overturn the Alberta Court of Appeal. But they, spelled, they, they, they used the word parole evidence rule and they spelled the word parole wrong. And I was so close. I so much wanted to make fun of them for doing that. Uh, but uh, I bit my tongue and didn't, even when it came, even when it came up. Um, the next three ones I call judi judicial piss off factors. So let's say you want to um, piss the piss off the judge. Maybe I shouldn't say piss off, but I've said it already. Let piss off factor number one is cite tons of cases. Uh, why? Because you're smart. It shows the, the court how, how smart you are. Like really, who cares? Like let that stuff go. Like I suggest to you, there's only you only need two cases. What I call the double L rule: the leading case, the latest case. That's all you need. Now there is a triple L case. Uh, triple L rule, which uh, a friend of mine who was the founding dean of Lakehead, Dean uh, Lee Stusser said, which is the triple L rule, he says, is a local case. So leading case, latest case, local case. That's all you need. That's all you need. If you want, uh, do a footnote that says see also, and then put a whole bunch of cases in there, but nobody's going to read it. Nobody will read it. You, you can put your laundry list in there and the name of the, the next name of your next cat or dog. Nobody reads that. Piss off number two 
is put in lots of quotes, long ones. Why? Because you're smart. Again, uh, foolish. Lots of people do it. Uh, so you keep it short, you use ellipsis, uh, break, even if it's a long quote, break it up. But usually in a quote, there's only a sentence or two max. And if there's two sentences, break it into two sentences. Piss off number three is put the case in and do not page, put the paragraph or page number. Uh, that's a real piss off to judges. Um, my wife was a judge, as Glenn may know, up until last year, equivalent of your Supreme Court. And uh, it pissed her off big time, but I knew this before. Like, you're basically telling the judge, like, I've read the freaking case. You read the whole case and figure out what paragraph is relevant. It just pick, pick, pisses them off. Like, every single time, footnote or otherwise, every single time you refer to a case, you put the page number in, the paragraph number in, and a minimum it shows the judge that you've read it, or at least you know where the page or paragraph number is. Um, let's skip over to the number... Uh, slide number 20, this is paragraph 55 in the paper, openings. It's important to have an opening and not simply just what I call a procedural history opening, uh, which could be in the issue section, like an issue section that says, you know, is the, we'll come to this in a minute, but the issue section, but like, it's too obvious and too easy to get lazy and just go to something like, uh, is the defendant liable in negligence to the plaintiff? Like, what a burst of creativity. Um, and then that's, that's, not, that's a legal question, not so much an issue. Anyway, so openings are important. So there's various, uh, in paragraph 55 and after, um, various options for dealing with openings. You can, it can be, um, you can lead with strength. It can be your strongest argument. It can be... Um, an introduction like uh, this is a complex case that are three key issues it can be something like that but have an opening that is not simply uh, the, the, a boring introduction uh, the next one slide 23 Glenn is table of contents the table of contents uh, may be your opening as well because if a judge and I saw my wife do it she'd go to the she'd go to the issue section often first if the issues, if, if the judge reads the issues section first, that's your opening. If the judge goes to the table of contents, that's your opening. So you you have to be focus on both of those. And the table of contents is in is in par paragraph sixty one and afterward. You should make a it a, a heading. Every heading should make a positive statement. So not simply an introduction. Not simply introduction like that's boring like it's almost invites someone to go to the end and go i wonder if the last paragraph says conclusion in front of the last paragraph like it's it's rather it's silly um and it just you muted again eugene you want to have a a, a, a positive statement that develops a logical flow and logical flow and i'll give you some examples of that There we go. Uh, Glenn, if you unmuted me there, thank you. Um, drafting points and issue is really, really tough. Um, I'll give you some examples of that in a few minutes. Um, it's the toughest thing to do is in, 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 in drafting because it's, it's difficult to avoid the lazy, easy, you know, like is the defendant liable and negligence to the plaintiff sort of thing. You've got to be a bit more engaging than that. And I'll give you some The reason the, the issues are important is that a well-written question uh, is suggestive of the answer. You can't be too manipulative on the other hand. You can't, um, uh, you've got to back off a little bit, but certainly a well-written question is suggestive of the answer or uh, may give you the whole answer depending on the case that you have. If you're the respondent, this is paragraph 70, uh, go to, slide 26 and 27 please Glenn if you're the respondent uh, the temptation is you have to do the job and respond uh, not necessarily it depends on the case you can play your own game I've been involved in in many cases where we have taken the position while well, the appellant says ABC well, that's those, those, are, those are not that relevant the real issues are XYZ and explain why those are the issues and you don't have to respond to everything that the appellant puts up if you've got a single winning argument, you can you can you can deal with that. Um, uh, 
Eugene, you're muted again. Thanks. You tell the court why, you answer your own questions, uh, you finish where you began, or you use the, uh, the, the I like to use the, the, something that comes out of Aboriginal law that I've done with, I've been involved in some cases where there's a circle, people sit in a circle, and um, so closing that circle can be important, and uh, writing something that says at the beginning of this argument I said this, I say this at the very end because and you, it permits you to close that circle and give reasons, and, and that's important. The last thing that is in the paper, which is in paragraph 77, is the power of simplicity. Uh, and that is, is this, like before, uh, when Abraham Lincoln spoke at Gettysburg in, uh, in 1863, the speaker before him was a congressman called Edward Everett. He was also a senator a governor of Massachusetts, minister to Great Britain, secretary of state, president of Harvard. He, uh, some considered him a spellbinding orator. He perhaps did too, because he spoke for two hours. Uh, not many people remember what he said, but um, the speaker after him was Lincoln. And Lincoln spoke for less than three minutes. And I invite you to Google, uh, there are actors who, give the Gettysburg Address uh, in the format, wearing the same costume and the same inflection, the same, the same talking that they thought Lincoln would give of the Gettysburg Address. And it's powerful. It's basically one paragraph. And it's a total of 272 words. And it's beautiful writing. And it's short and simple. And it's to the point. Um, and for, ex for example, I'll just read you two sentences. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little know it, nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus so far nobly advanced. Like it, it's beautiful writing and you can write, you don't have to be John Grisham and you don't have to be that smooth and eloquent, but you can write well. Like when I started off doing this kind of work um, in appellate advocacy, I wasn't a good writer. I learned an awful lot. I read an awful lot of factums that I learned from others. And I, now and then I come up with some creative ideas myself, as you will. Um, but it's, you can improve by practice just as you can improve uh, like I, I've done a lot of whitewater kayaking. I take kayaking lessons this summer I, with a, with a, at a course here. Um, I've been kayaking probably for 40 years. I still want to get better. Um, and I take lessons. And I still practice doing an Eskimo role. Um, you have to practice. You get practice, you get better. So uh, thank you, merci. And in the language of the Denny, uh, Masi Cho. Let's go to the examples. Um, any comments or questions from anybody via Glenn, or if you simply unmute and you want to ask me or send a chat via Glenn, uh, you can ask me anything you want before we go to the tabs and the attachments. Okay, let's go. Shall we proceed? Uh, let's go on then to uh, tab one of the materials that you either have or will get. Tab one is a selected bibliography. Um, there's, if there, there's two things that I would point out to you there. Um, uh, and that is, um, and that is the, there's a book by Lee Stusser. Stusser is S T E uh, S T U E S S E R. It's called an advocacy primer. Um, and it's a very good book. Uh, I think the most recent edition is the fourth edition and it's called an advocacy primer. That's worth getting if you, if you buy nothing else. Um, um, I, there's a, a, a question from Heather Kane. I'll come to that in a moment. Thank you, Heather. Um, but if you leave that, leave that on the screen if you can, or send it to me again. Um, uh, John Laskin, there's a, he, there's a piece that he's done. I think it's on the website. I like forget that it's called Forget the Wind Up and Make the Pitch. Uh, some suggestions for writing more persuasive factions, factums. Uh, that's also very good. Uh, Heather, what was your question? If you want to unmute or send it to me again. Eugene, her question, her question was, what are your thoughts about writing in a more legalese way when writing to opposing counsel? 
Um, including to opposing counsel, I try to not to write in an overly, in a legalistic way. Uh, so I don't use Latin. Um, I try not to get very formal. I try to keep it very short. I try not to dictate it. Um, I still handwrite or, um, or type. If I want to do something very carefully, I handwrite it. So including with opposite counsel, you don't need to be legalistic. Um, um, like, and you can, you can bridge it, uh, bridge, bridge and explain you getting away from the legalism by saying, like bridge it by saying, you know, I'd like to get practical here, or I'd like to get right to the point, or what this case is really about is this. So if you do a little bridging set up like that, it permits you to get away from writing a, like a lawyer. That's my suggestion, and that's what I do. Like, I try to do things that are different. Um, like, I, I, I'll tell you something that I do, and uh, you're far enough away in the Northwest Territories. Um, I don't like anybody copying, like, this idea, for example. Like, if I'm doing an affidavit, and it's more than a couple of pages, I put in headings in the affidavit, and I often put in a table of contents in the affidavit. Because I want the reader, uh, either the other side or the judge or the arbitrator, to know that I've gone to some trouble. And is the table of contents sworn to? Absolutely. Heading sworn to? Absolutely too. So that's a thing. That's a thing that I do uh, if I'm if I if I'm doing something at the at the affidavit stage uh, that, that that is different from others. Uh, don't tell anybody in Ottawa if you if you don't mind. Um, Let's go to the next tab. I'm still unmuted. Tab two is, uh, Glenn, may I ask you if you've been able to get the tabs out to the registrants? Yes, everybody has them now, Eugene. So everybody's got the tabs. Great, yes. that's, that's very helpful. Glenn, thank you for doing that. So if you go to tab two and open that up, you'll see that there is, uh, it says Acme Building and Construction Limited. Um, it's an actual case. And then the memorandum will respond that an application leaves appeal. So it's a response factor at the leave stage. So if you go to the next page, you'll see a statement of facts, which covers the whole page. The whole page. And then if you go to the statement of argument, it's about a quarter of a page, maybe a third. So um, you know, the signal here to the reader is, even though this is at the Swing of Canada, the signal to the reader is, this is about the facts. This is all about the facts. The facts are way more important than any law here. And sometimes that's the case, including at the Supreme Court of Canada. If the facts are strongly on your side, that's where you go. And um, you also see in this that I, the first paragraph is nature of case. Uh, so it's kind of like a Tim Horton's opening instead of this case is about. Uh, clear contractual covenants govern. So clear CCCG. I tried to come up with four words where they all began with C, uh, but I, 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 I did think of the synonym for uh, govern that did begin with a C, but I can't remember what it is now, but uh, I had to do this quickly and this is what I did. So the table of contents is important. And the other thing that is really helpful in this one here is much of the story is told in the table of contents. The table, the, the headings, the headings generally make a positive statement and the headings generally flow one upon the other. So this table of contents was done so as that if either the table of contents is run, read first or the person goes through it and looks at the, um, reads the, the headings in the actual memorandum, they're going to get it from there. So um, the story can be told in the table of contents and it, and it's, and it, it can be helpful to do that. Tab 3A starts on Thursday, July 1. Um, dates, lawyers love to use dates. Dates are usually irrelevant. If they're irrelevant, they shouldn't go in. Now, this is a first draft. Let me tell you a little, uh, tell you the, the truth actually, that it wasn't the first draft. It was the final draft that a lawyer sent to me and said, check it over for technical compliance. Um, uh, uh, it's a legal aid case. We've got no money left. Just check it over for technical technical compliance and file it. So like, why don't we together just look at this together? So Thursday, July 1, 1999. Um, okay, is it like is the date important? If the date's not important, you shouldn't go in. The accused, okay, the accused, accused are you know, bad people. Donna Cora Lawrence, um, bad people have three names. 
was convicted following a trial, so they didn't plea out uh, before a Supreme Court, so not a provincial court judge, Supreme Court sitting with a jury, oh, jury as well, two charges, okay, two, not one, criminal negligence causing death, oh, crap, bodily harm, and two charges of impaired, holy crap, this is our side, how are we doing so far, like, the crown, you want to read the crown's factum is worse or better, depending on your perspective. So that's that's not that's not really working. So I asked the lawyer involved, who's now retired, can I, and we had to file next day. I said, if you don't mind, I wasn't planning to get a lot of sleep tonight. I'd like to do that now and then to, for practice. Uh, can I rewrite uh, some of this or all of it overnight? We'll talk in the morning and then if I come up with another draft, you pick what you want to file. And he said, sure. Uh, but again, he said, legal aid, no money. And I said, that's fine. So if you look at, go to 3B, 3B you'll see is typed in bold. The reason it's typed in bold is I did this during a night and I couldn't get the bold off. Now, if you can't get the bold off, I now know how to do that. Italics, I can underline too. If you're not sure how to do that, call me. I'll tell you how to do that. I can do that now, but I couldn't get the bold off. So it's all typed uh, in bold. This test case is about to Tim Hortons or opening Jura Bias. So you can see like it's, um, it's a draft. The middle of the night draft. Brief, brief chronology of facts. That's important because it permits signals to the reader that you're going to tell them a story. It's going to be brief. There's going to be a chronology and it's the facts. So it's a really good bridging intro to, to sort of mention before you get into, into what it is. And because you're saying brief, you're telling the reader, I'm not going to tell you absolutely everything. Like if it, if it wasn't raining, I'm not going to tell you that because it's not relevant. So if you go to tab three, You muted again, Eugene. Okay, back off. Tab 3C is the final draft as, as filed. So if you go to the table of content, you'll see trial transcript and a whole bunch of pages. Now, nobody in the right mind, that's a cliche, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, nobody uh, is going to read the trial, read that and go, look at all the pages there. Not, the pages are irrelevant, but it's a signal. It's a signal to the reader. If they go to the table of contents first, this is about what happened at trial. This is about trial, not even if it's on appeal, it's about trial. And then if you go to turn over the page, um, you'll see there's a memorandum of argument. So there's a certain amount of detail there. And then skip ahead and you'll go to the statement of facts. And it says test case, uh, effective police losing evidence, etc. It's kind of long, um, but it's still not, it's, it's, it's too long. This test case is about four bullets, so white space, because bullet, bullet four, and you've got down whether a person can be charged and convicted twice for the same delict, the same delict. And then brief chronology of facts, brief uh, facts are as follows. Now, so let's go to uh, the beginning of the story, if you want. Like the big, uh, so I've rewritten this to say on Wednesday. Now I know, the dates not don't normally shouldn't go in, but I wanted the date. I wanted to put Wednesday in because it's, it's the middle of the week. So I put the date in. Donna Lawrence has now got two names. Forty-seven-year-old married working mother of two woke at five a.m. to prepare for her day. Isn't that how her day all starts? Now maybe not at five a.m., but that's the start to the story. And then and then the story the story develops. Um, and then if you go down to uh, or scroll down to page six, you'll see a paragraph there that is also paragraph six. Now, let me ask you this. If, if let's say I th this trial went about uh, a week to 10 days, if I gave any one of you, um, or if Glenn gave any one of you um, the transcript for uh, a week long trial, how long could you, how long would it take you to summarize it and how long how many pages could you summarize it in? If you could summarize it in 10 pages, 20, that'd be great. But here's much of what happened in a single paragraph, and it's done in a diagram. And if you look at the headings, who confused, uh, who testified confused, disoriented? Who testified difficulty walking? Who testified no smell of alcohol? Who testified smell of alcohol? So if you go through that, you'll see that there's blanks here and that some people testified that there's some things and, and, and not others. And again, the signal to the reader is, is it's not clear. It's not clear what happened. Now, it, we could get into uh, what about reasonable doubt. Didn't get into that because that, again, that's letting, letting the reader uh, think about that for, them, for themselves. Paragraph seven, took the stand in our own defense. 
So if you go to the next paragraph, which is uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, let me um, let you read page 7. Let me give you a minute or two to read page 7 and see if you notice something uh, on page 7. You can read it relatively quickly. So read 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. You don't read the rest of 12, just read the beginning of number 12. Does anybody uh, want to unmute themselves and tell me what you notice? Anybody there? If you look at paragraph 12, paragraph 8, I'm sorry, you'll see that Donna was convicted, past tense. Nine, the day after trial, Donna's lawyer happened to be in the and was approached, past tense. Ten, what happened was that, past tense. Eleven, Donna said she passed tense. The paragraph 12. Now read all of paragraph 12 to yourself. Donna now lives at home. Goes over into paragraph uh, page eight. Now you see there that pa page uh, seven and eight, paragraph 12, that's really a conclusion. You don't have to put the conclusion at the end of the whole fact and the conclusion can go where you think the conclusion should be best go. So the facts are strong here and that's, that's, the, uh, that, that's the facts we put in there. That's really the conclusion. And you'll notice that, to speak plainly, paragraphs 8, 9, 10, 11, all past tense. Paragraph 12, present tense. In other words, the bad stuff is in the past tense. The good stuff, the positive stuff is in the present tense. That's where she is now. And if you go to the paragraph uh, 13, you'll see points and issue. There's an example of how to do issues. So I have a heading, it's what the way I normally do, we nor I normally do it. We put a heading in, in bold, and then an explanatory pa short paragraph or sentence underneath that. That's a sort of a, a more, I don't want to say inclusive, but it's a more uh, understandable way to draft issues. Um, tab four. It's a case called Claude John and Rose John. Um, this was an application relief to appeal. Uh, I was working with a very capable lawyer in London called Barbara Leggett. Barbara is a personal injury plaintiff side lawyer. And we wanted to do, um, develop a case and, and also win the case that whereby we could establish new law for not just social host liability, but commercial host liability commercial host liability. And if you look at, uh, you can look at the table of contents. Table of contents is good. Uh, but before we get into, if you go to um, page one, you'll see it says test case. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the way we, this was drafted. Um, uh, there's a form of storytelling called parallelism. Um, and it's used in TV a lot because it's effective, it works. And parallelism is where you have, it's usually three, sometimes four stories that are going along at the same time. A lot of sitcoms and movies also have the same thing. See it, like I go to the gym, uh, well, not during COVID, uh, and watch sometimes out of on the treadmill and watch something CSI, New York, whatever, Las Vegas. There's usually, it's almost always three themes there's three particular themes going. And it keeps you interested because theme one, theme two, theme three, and they intersect. Like someone is married, someone's not married, someone has a dog, and how does this interact when the dog eats a cat or the cat attacks a dog? Or, but, but how they interplay between these, between these, uh, these themes that are parallel to, and can be told in parallel. So if you look at page one here, you'll see the Tim, Tim Horton's opening this test case is about. And then you, if you go to uh, paragraph three, the company's control over the workplace and employee. Now, that's a theme, but it's also a heading. It's a theme as well as uh, an overall theme, but it's one of the parallel themes, if you want. So the company had basically saying the company had control over the workplace and the employees. So what was happening here was the night shift were drinking alcohol and getting blotto in the employee parking lot belonging to the company and the company knew. 
and the company knew. So that so you'll see and you'll you'll if you go through it, so everything flows through to that heading. And then you uh, there's ex explanation there. You'll see there's um, a point for his writing. So if you were to paragraph 12, general foreman tells the company about the drinking. Um, paragraph 13, the security personnel hired by the company reported evidence of drinking in the company, like no company response. And so it goes on, like um, conclusion after conclusion, if you, if you want, if you wish. And then it goes on to, uh, page six, Sean Flynn's history of the company. So this is theme number two, if you want. Not if you want, it is. It is theme number two. Flynn lives 20 to 25 minutes from the factory. That's all the paragraph says. That's all it has to say. He has a long-standing pattern. And then paragraph 31, the company knows Flynn is an alcoholic because, and you have all the bullets there, they all back it up. So clearly they knew and they did nothing. And then if you turn the, turn the page, over to Claude John. Claude John. Now you'll notice here the heading does not have, a, doesn't make a positive statement like many other headings. It just gives his name. The reason for that is to say, oh, the reader may say, Claude John, who is he? So it says who he is. Claude John is a married man with two children. Okay, uh, and it says what he does, and he is a stay-at-home dad, and the mother works outside the home as well as inside the home. I'm sure. And then, the, and then there's, here's how it all comes together. The last shift before the crash. Not before the motor vehicle accident. It was a crash. Um, so Flynn night, works night shift. Uh, you know where this is going to go. Um, and that's exactly where it goes. And Claude John took two years to die. And he died. And we sued on the basis of that the company had commercial host liability we lost uh, the case, um, and, uh, unfortunately, but you win, uh, you lose, and you continue on. Uh, paragraph, uh, tab 5A, we're 10 minutes to, uh, tab 5A, it says first draft, if you can go there. First draft, now, um, can I ask for a volunteer amongst any one of you uh, please to read paragraph one starting the orders off. Could you either, un could somebody unmute themselves and just tell me that they can read this? Any one person. Um, uh, Glenn, are you, can, Glenn, can you hear me all right? Yeah, you're good, Eugene. Okay. Um, Glenn, uh, what, can you read paragraph one to yourself there and tell us what you get from it? I can't without losing the screen. Okay, then, okay, then, then, <laughs> then, then do not. So let me just simply explain. Paragraph one of the thing that says first draft, it wasn't the first draft. The lawyer said, file it and uh, read it and file it. It says, the orders of the Honorable Mr. Justice VWM Smith. So the first time I read that, I, I thought to myself, VW, I wonder if he's called Volkswagen. Like, like maybe that was his nickname at school. Like, why, why does he have VW? Why do they, why three names? Like, uh, why not make it four? And, and, it, and so it's a standard procedural history opening. It basically tells, in this case, if you Supreme Court of Canada, the matter went to trial and then it went to the Court of Appeal. Like, really? Like, as if the Supreme Court of Canada is going, going to, really? Your case went to trial and then it went to the Court of Appeal. And then it came here. Wow, that's amazing. Like, that's never happened to us before. Um, it, it just, it does not work. So if you go to 5B, you'll see that, and again, I had to do this overnight. Well, I didn't have to, I volunteered. And you'll see that the same material, exactly the same material is drafted uh, with headings, present circumstances of the parties. And it starts off the applicant as a corporal. And if you read that paragraph, in the single paragraph, you'll see the identification of who is who, the disparity in job status or perceived job status, the disparity in income, and you'll see that the corporal and the, R the, RCM the RCMB corporal is applying to cancel both ongoing child support and arrears. Arrears. So he is behind in his support payments for his, for the one remaining child of the marriage. So, and the word arrears is the last word of that paragraph, and and that that word is itself is itself a conclusion. 
Par uh, tab six, the second last, or almost the second last uh, tab, tab six is called Archean Resources. Now let me ask you, is there anything worse in the world than a statutory interpretation case about a tax statute? Builders' liens uh, might be more interesting. Um, aspects of intellectual property may be more interesting, but uh, I don't think there's anything worse. So Mary France and I, uh, and Jeff Bedell, and now at a different firm, I had this case, and it was a tax case on a statutory interpretation case. So if you go to, if you go to, um, we came up with this idea, we call it magic boxes. Now it's not at all a magic box, but uh, if you go to page seven, you'll see a box there that is headed purposive or pragmatic approach in plain, or the other one is plain meaning approach. So you're dividing, uh, visually you're dividing up, you're telling the reader, there's two ways to look at this. You can go this way or you can go that way. And then if you go to the next page, you'll see the same headings as there. Purposive or pragmatic approach, plain meaning approach. And what we've done here is drop in uh, the, the jurisprudence. So rather than boring page upon more boring pages of what the jurisprudence says, it actually drops it into, into what the separation is. So it, it makes it, um, I don't want to say more interesting, but less boring, more understandable. You can get the point very quickly um, as, to, as to where this is going. Like there's two ways to look at this, it's this way and that way. Okay, last is tab 7A, an application for leave to appeal. Now, uh, this is a case where uh, a person was charged no trial for about four years. So nothing happened for four years. Now that's a difficult thing to do, to strategize, to come up with an example. This is beyond saying nothing happened. So I came up with this really brilliant idea, but let me explain. Whenever I come up with a brilliant idea, you can ask my wife, it's always a stupid idea. So let me show you the temporarily brilliant idea, which is in fact completely stupid. I come up with this idea that I would draft a brief procedural chronology. So day one, this happens, day five, month one, month one, and go through the whole four years. You know, basically it chooses another council, the cat dies, he falls down the stairs, whatever. And there's two pages of that. So I go home and I tell my wife what a smart lawyer I am, which is stupid because I'm not smart. And it's a mistake to call your, to let your wife know that because she'll, she or he will shoot you down. So I, I, next morning I looked at it and it's a completely stupid thing because all I did, all I did was explain the four years. Like the Crown could not have done a better job. I, I did their job. Uh, I, I was brilliant from, from their perspective but stupid from mine. So in a mad uh, rush, I had to come up with something. So I had no time. And what I did was, and if you go to tab 7B1, which is the cover page, and then tab 7B2, you'll come up with a diagram, which is red. And you'll see there, and it's a pull-out diagram. So it says uh, 11 by 17. So it's double size. Um, and it folds out and you'll see it's in red. And what is interesting here, and what I find exciting, in fact, is that exactly the same information, exactly the same information that was in the two pages of everything that happened is in here. But because it's in a visual presentation, whereas the words push you one way to indicate nothing, uh, that the words tell you that a lot happened, here a reader might look at this and go, uh, red is nothing happened, white is something happened, and the something is always explained. It's always explained. Uh, when something did happen and there's still no trial. So what is really cool, in fact, exciting, I think, uh, is that you present something in the visual way, it pushes the brain in a different direction. It, it pushes the brain to, to, to make the decision for itself, himself, herself, that not much happened. And that's important too. There's a lawyer that I know, and some of you may know him, called John Folds. At, uh, at Fields in Edmonton. And he has what I call the John Folds uh, uh, theory of dots level of argument. And that is most lawyers will connect all the dots all the way down to the garden path. And what John Folds theory is that you back off, you don't give the conclusion, you back off, you come back a couple of dots from the conclusion and let the reader, the listener, uh, the judge, the arbitrator go to that conclusion. It becomes their decision. And that's completely different from you saying, here's the decision you must make. 
uh, that's a completely different situation, and that's partly what is what what I'm doing here. And it's and uh, it's something I've learned from John Folds, and it's a great idea to back off from the conclusion. No, different if you're giving uh, the point first writing. That's a different type of conclusion. You're giving conclusion for a particular point that, for example, Mr. Flynn was an alcoholic. The company knew. That, that's a conclusion, a factual conclusion. It's not a legal conclusion. A legal conclusion you can back off. And those are my comments, uh, Glenn and colleagues. If anybody has any comments or questions, or you can send me an email afterwards, I, I welcome your comments. As a, you'll see from the paper that there's a mistake that is deliberately put into here in this material, a very common mistake that is not caught by spell check. Be very careful of spell check. Be very careful of grammar check as well. Like spell, if you put in the rapist instead of therapist, the spell check will not catch that. So yes, you spell check, but read it through very carefully. Like when I read something, I read with a, with a ruler in order to slow me down. Comments, questions either now or uh, here and after by email, um, you're welcome. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, let's just wait a couple of minutes and see if anybody throws anything up on the chat or if anybody wants to unmute and ask a question. Okay. Uh, again, if you did not get the materials, we sent them out to everybody who registered. If you didn't get them, please let me know and we will get them out to you. Um, yeah, there's a, Heather just kind of had a very good uh, suggestion that came up is to, is to read sentences backwards. That's a good, that's a good idea. Uh, that's a very good idea. What I often do, Heather, actually, is if I'm, if I'm proofreading a factum, I'll often start at the end and come, come backwards. Uh, because, because, and the other thing is I do, is I'll get somebody else to read it because if you've, if you've drafted it or revised it an awful lot of times, your, your mind, your eyes become blind to it. You, you just don't catch mistakes. So mixing it up by reading a sentence backwards or reading it by, by the set, like a paragraph backwards, is a, it's a, that's a really good idea. All right, Eugene, I'm not seeing anything else. So let me thank you once again for taking some time and doing this. Welcome. Um, I always appreciate and I always get something out of all of your presentations. Uh, everybody, um, oh wait, one more chat. Heather, uh, thank you for no, saying thank I, you and let me say that thank you for your excellent, uh, excellent comments and questions. Uh, I'm still learning. If anybody has any suggestions and things that I can learn from and improve, please let me know. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye.